Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Apps and AT Across the Curriculum, Google and iOS. Happy that you could join us, whether it's this afternoon or this evening for you, depending on what part of the country you may be joining us from. Excellent that you could be here. So I'm your host and facilitator this evening, Diana Petschauer. I'm a Resna Certified Assistive Technology Professional and Consultant, as well as a faculty trainer at CTD, Center on Technology and Disability, consultant at AT for Education, Assistive Technology for Education, uh, founder and lead consultant there. We do have several consultants on our team who travel daily to provide assistive technology evaluations, assessments for students to access education as well as adults to access the workplace environment. We certainly also provide professional development workshops and training as well as webinars such as this one and online learning. So glad you could be with us and just going to be demonstrating for most of the evening. So hopefully you will enjoy the live demonstrations of these assistive technologies. I will be covering Google Chrome, uh, which works well on those Google Chromebooks if you're in a school that's gone Google, as well as any laptop, Mac, or PC. And I'll also be demonstrating iOS via an iPad. And we'll be discussing apps, extensions, as well as built-in accessibility features to support diverse learners as well as all of your learners when we're talking about the university design for learning environment. I'll be touching upon things for reading and writing support, executive function, accessible educational materials, accessible textbooks and handouts and worksheets, research skills, as well as um, memory and recall, mind mapping, brainstorming, math support, and low vision support um, so that no matter what device or platform your student may be using or individual that you're working with, hopefully introduce some um, apps or extensions or assistive technologies that will be helpful. So this is the link to your handout. It was emailed to you. It will be emailed again to you after the presentation upon your completion of the evaluation form that will be sent to you. If you want to go ahead and type this into your URL and hit enter, or you should have a link in your email, and you click on it, and you will get to the handout, which is a Google Doc for the presentation this afternoon. It has links to all the apps and extensions, as well as the information that I'm going to be talking about. It is an ongoing Google Doc, which means I can add to it and update it, and you will always receive the updates, which is really great. Um, so you will have access to that now, um, as well as after this presentation. And it is a handout for an all-day workshop training, so it's several pages long. I won't be able to cover certainly everything on the handout in an hour, but I'm going to do my best to give you the best of the best in this hour that we have together. So we'll be diving into examples and demonstrations. I am going to start with Google, and then I'm going to move over and reflect my iPad to demonstrate everything on iOS and the iPad. And um, certainly at the end of the presentation, you will have our contact information. But for right now, we're going to go into the examples and demonstrations. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And we are going to start with Google. So it's just going to take a moment for me to share my screen. And there we have the desktop. So again, here is the handout. I see some of you popping up on there. Excellent. Use that link that you received in your handout in your email rather to get to the handout. It will be emailed to you afterwards if you didn't get it. No worries. Um, so not to make you dizzy, but just to scroll down a little bit to give you a preview from this webinar, we're going to start with Google. Everything that I talk about is here, as well as links to get to the specific apps and extensions that I'm going to be talking about. I won't get to all of them, but I'll get to a good uh, number of them, starting with extensions and moving on to apps. And then further on in the handout, uh, definitely check out those resources later after tonight. I won't be able to get to, but they're really great resources for you to um, search for more Google Chrome apps and extensions that you might find helpful for your learners. And then the second part will be iOS. So I'll switch over to my iPad to show a few of the built-in accessibility features. And then here you have a matrix of the apps that I'm recommending on the iPad. Again, about 11 pages long, so you will have this afterwards because we won't get to all of them, but certainly you may find the links and the information on those apps helpful. It is a Google Doc. Feel free to share with your colleagues. So we're going to get started with the Google Chrome portion of 
this afternoon's training. So I am in Google Chrome. That is the Chrome browser. You absolutely need the Chrome browser to access these Google Chrome apps and extensions. Um, sometimes I present on this and individuals trying to get to these using Internet Explorer or Firefox or Safari. It's great to use those browsers, but you're not going to be able to get to these Google apps and extensions. Okay, So you do have to download the Chrome browser. The link is on the handout. It's free for anyone to have on any device. And when you are in Google, you will see an icon that looks like a little waffle where my mouse is in the top left or a little square of squares. It says Apps. You may see it also in the bottom of your screen as the uh, launcher. If you're on a Chromebook, you're going to see a little circle or magnifying glass to the bottom left. And, uh, this information is on your handout as well. And when you click on there, you'll be able to click on All Apps. And it will have that same icon, that little waffle or square of mini squares. By clicking on there, you will get to your apps if you have any downloaded. You can see I have several pages of apps downloaded. Um, I can scroll through several pages. There are phenomenal free and low cost apps. The majority of them, 98% I would say, are free. Um, if they have a cost, it's usually a free trial for about 30 months, and it will tell you if there's a subscription yearly. So you can click on the description of any of them. And where you get these Chrome apps and extensions is in the Chrome Web Store. So it's this icon here. It looks like a little beach ball in a beach bag. It says Web Store. If you don't see this icon for whatever reason, you can simply just do a search Chrome Web Store, and you will get to the exact same place that I am showing you this evening. So if I click on Chrome Web Store, this is going to bring me to the Chrome Web Store where you can download these apps and extensions that I'm talking about. Okay? And this is also listed. All of these apps and extensions are listed on your handout. And if you click on the link, it is a direct hyperlink to the apps and extensions that I'm talking about. So sometimes you might forget the one that I mentioned. It's on the handout. No worries. Just go back to it, click on it. You'll be able to get to the one that I'm talking about. I do highly recommend that you come to this Chrome Web Store and search by the features that your student needs. So things like mind mapping and brainstorming, scheduling and reminders, um, things to support executive function or literacy. Maybe they need text-to-speech or speech recognition, voice recognition. You can also search by specific subject. You can search by science or biology, interactive periodic table. You can search by history, math. There's definitely a lot of math support here as well. So you can see in the Chrome Web Store, I've just typed in mind mapping. So if I'm looking for some great mind mapping apps for my students to use for creating a mind map or a brainstorm prior to doing an activity or a paper, you can see that it gives me some options here. And if I want to download something and I don't already have it, and it's going to have this little blue button here to the, to the right that says Add to Chrome, and it has a plus sign. And all I need to do is click on that button that says Add to Chrome with the plus sign, and I'm going to have that app or extension. Very quick and easy, it adds it immediately. You may, with certain apps and extensions, get a few pop-up windows that ask you to allow absolutely allow it or it's not going to work. So you do need to allow access to those apps and extensions. So I'm clicking on that little waffle, that little app icon in the top left again. So you can see when I have downloaded an app, when I've added an app, it shows up here on my main app page. If I've added an extension, you get them both from the same place, the same web store. An extension shows up to the top right of my browser, where my mouse is in the top right. These little icons, the one looks like a little yin-yang, a little computer screen, um, and a couple of circles here. These are extensions. And the difference is that the apps, they're going to launch and just do their own thing. If I click on Typing Club, it's going to launch just like a typical app on a tablet, and I'm going to do the Typing Club app. If I have an extension, these little symbols to the top right, it means that that extension is going to affect the website or document that I'm in. And I'm going to demonstrate that tonight so you understand that. So the extension is going to affect the website that I'm on or that Google Doc or that Google Slide presentation because these work in everything Google. The other important thing to note is that these apps and extensions follow the student or individual login. So my apps and extensions follow my login. I log into Google on my laptop. I have these apps and extensions. I go to a public library and log into my Google Chrome, I have these apps and extensions, or a friend's house. Or if I go to a Chromebook at a school and I log into my account, I have my apps and extensions. And that works for your students as well. So they may be using a Chromebook at school, and they'll have these apps and extensions. And then they go home to their own laptop. They work on Mac or PC, as long as you have the Chrome browser. 
sometimes they're going to be using something like the Surface Pro or another type of tablet, and they will have these apps and extensions to use. These additional Chrome apps and extensions that I'm getting from the Chrome Web Store, they do not work on the iPad, hence why I'm doing the second half of the session, which will be all the iPad apps, or some of them, the ones we can get to this evening. So Google and Apple certainly compete, and Google's not going to allow their apps and extensions to work on the iPad because then you wouldn't download their apps from the App Store. So these are everything but the iPad. If your student's using the Chromebook, a Mac or PC laptop, Surface Pro, these apps and extensions can support your learners on those platforms. So we're going to dive into a couple of these. We're going to start with extensions. So I've just opened up a typical website where the student may be researching or reading. And first I want to show you some extensions for basic access. If you're using those Chromebooks, you know and your students know that those screens are very small, or at least smaller than a typical laptop, and sometimes the font is small. We may have low vision users who need access to this text before they can even start reading the website or using the information in the Google Docs. So there are a few extensions to support the access to that text. But the first extension that I want to show you that's on the handout is actually called Extensity. It looks like this little yin yang to the top right where my mouse is now. And when I click on Extensity, I get this nice drop-down menu of all of my extensions and apps that I have downloaded. This is managing my extensions. It's a nice organizational tool. You can see how many apps I have downloaded. It would be impossible to remember them all or to get to them all easily. I have a lot of extensions as well. As soon as you download Extensity, it automatically puts your apps and extensions in this nice alphabetical list. You don't have to do anything. It does it for you. And you can get to them quickly and easily, meaning turning them on or turning them off from this drop-down menu. So the very first one, and this is free, Extensity is free. If I click on one quick timer, for example, which is one of the extensions I have, you see that it lights up. The little icon shows up for one quick timer to the top right here where my mouse is. And I can start using one quick timer. If I click on it again, it grays out. It's no longer active. I've disabled it. So I can quickly turn off or on extensions that I need to use by using Extensity. And if you have as many downloaded as I have, or at least three or four or more, you're going to want to use Extensity because you don't need to have all of them running at the same time. And if you do, it's going to slow down your computer significantly. Some of them play nicely together. The majority of them do, but they don't all. So it's nice to turn on one at a time and make sure it works well, and then turn on a second. And if it starts to get glitchy, then you know those two extensions are up. Don't play nicely together. But again, the majority of them do. So nice to have Extensity. It is free. And if you want to see one click timer, I start one click timer very quick and easily. I can click on my one click timer icon. And now I have a nice visual timer up to 60 minutes, but I can set this visual and audio. You will hear what that audio sounds like in just a few minutes. So we'll set it for three minutes. It will be in the background for those learners where you need to say three more minutes until this transition, et cetera. It's nice. There are other timers such as progress bar timers. These are all the types of things you would search for in that app store. Just search for timers and you'll get to different options. The next extension that I want to show you is called High Contrast. So again, these extensions you would download from the Chrome Web Store. They would show up as icons here, and then you can use them while you're on the Internet or in a Google Doc or in a Google presentation. High contrast is this little circle, black and white. When I click on it and I click Enable, you can see that now I have high contrast. I have various options. I can choose Normal, Increased Contrast, Grayscale, Inverted Color, inverted grayscale, and yellow on black. For our students who have learning disabilities or low vision, these are significant. They may be using another type of software or even a CCTV that's expensive, upwards of five to $10,000 compared to this extension that's free, that will allow them to have this accessible text while they're on a Chromebook or a laptop or a Mac, any of those devices just by having this extension. They can choose the type of font that they need. Again, the increased contrast, grayscale is excellent for our learners who may be colorblind. <coughs> Inverted color in yellow on black. Really important for you to be aware of, not only for your low vision users, but also for those with cortical visual impairment, CVI. A lot of students are becoming diagnosed prevalently with CVI. Thank goodness it's being recognized more now. If you're not aware, 
CVI or cortical visual impairment is an impairment um, of vision, but it's not based on a uh, damage to the eye. It's not damage to the eye that's causing the visual impairment. It's actually neurological. It's something that's happening in their brain that is affecting their vision. And it can affect, can affect their vision so that it's changing every 10 minutes or every hour. It's very difficult for a typical eye doctor to diagnose, and they typically don't diagnose this. Um, teachers are visually impaired and a few other professionals are especially trained to diagnose cortical visual impairment. And a student or an individual adult can walk away from an eye doctor appointment with 20-20 vision and they will not be diagnosed with CVI because that person does not know how to diagnose it. So that means that our learners are struggling with reading. They're being told that this is how they should be seeing something when in fact they are not. And the majority of my learners, students and adults that have cortical visual impairment significantly need and read and improve reading and access to text with this high contrast, white on black or yellow on black. It's free. We know that some of our students with dyslexia and learning disabilities also need this and benefit from it. It's much easier for them to read the text and improve their comprehension and reading speed. Oop, there's our one quick timer. So not a foghorn, but a nice little timer that goes off. Um, so again, back to the high contrast, Universal design for learning, this is something that benefits all of us. Sometimes our eyes are just fatiguing while we're reading. It's nice to have access to this. Other times it's going to be for our students who absolutely need this in order to access their text, and it is a free extension that you can add. Another great one to consider is called Visor. And with Visor, you're able to control the color background. So for our students who need a color overlay for reading, um, and a special mouse spotlight, you can change the amount of red, green, or blue. You can change the transparency. And you can change the size of the mouse spotlight. And now that's going to follow their mouse cursor as they're reading again on the internet or if they're reading in a Google Doc or other place where they're reading. And if we click on the visor icon, that little computer icon, and click the blue button, it goes back to typical. So very easy on, easy off. The other extension that I have open in the top right, this is called Stay Focused. We all benefit from an extension like Stay Focused. Looks like a blue circle with a black one inside of it. And in our options for Stay Focused, you can see that we could set the maximum time allowed per day, up to 10 minutes or as long as you need to. Active days, I like this. So you can set it on the fly. You can turn it on the fly. But if you're going to have it set for school days, for example, or work days, what hours during those specific days, and whether there's a daily reset time. And then you're going to specifically copy and paste or put in the website URL for the website that you want to block. And they suggest a few. So things that are going to be distracting like email, YouTube, video game websites, any of those websites that you know that you or your students go to that distract you from working or distract them from writing or working, so for 10 minutes, we are going to stay focused without the distractions or ability to go to these different websites. Um, for adults, certainly that's our email, our social media, for students it's social media or other websites that they're prone to go to instead of completing work. So it's nice that you can block them and keep them stay focused. You can see that there's an option for the allowed site and the nuclear option, which is lovely. All websites block everything, absolutely everything, um, and for how long. So it's nice that you can just launch this on the go use it as you need to, or you can specifically customize it and schedule it to the specific needs of the learner. And turn off the Stay Focused. A quick couple of demonstrations for one of the other extensions. <clears throat> I'm going to go into my Extensity now. I'm going to turn off the ones that I just showed you. So I'm going to turn off High Contrast and Stay Focused and Visor. I'm doing this all in my Extensity. I'm turning off one quick timer. I'm going to turn on Read and Write for Google as well as a screenshot reader. And I'm going to turn on Session Buddy and One Tab. Okay. So I've turned on a few other extensions to show you, and then we'll be diving into a couple of apps, and then we'll be switching over to the iPad just to give you a rundown. So we're in Google, and the extensions that I just opened here through my Extensity, I'll show you first Session Buddy, top right. It looks like a little blue and white square. I use this all the time myself professionally. I have a lot of students that love to use Session Buddy. 
So most of the time I have at least 10 windows open, 10 tabs open, my email, sometimes social media. I definitely have presentations or slideshow presentations that I'm working on. I have things that I have open that I've opened that I want to get back to and read later. Uh, websites open where I'm researching. For your students, they may be researching on several websites, also have their email, have a presentation, a Google Doc open, and then they have to shut down and go to the next class real quick, or they have to shut down and go home. They may be leaving the device that they're working on. They could be working on a Chromebook at, home, at school rather, with all of these windows open, and they're going to go home and they want to get back to all of these things. So how do they do that? So they can do that with Session Buddy. And so again, this little blue and white square, it is free. You click on Session Buddy, it automatically puts everything that you're working on, even if it's a presentation, a slideshow, a Google Doc, etc., puts it here right in this nice list. In the top right, I can save this session. So I'm going to typically I put in the date and something I'm working on at the time. And then click OK. And now on the left hand side you can see that I have this session saved. I have several sessions saved. So I use this often so I can get back to any of them. And you can see that it's actually automatically saving sessions, which I did put in my settings. So if you have learners who would benefit from using Session Buddy, but you think they might forget to save their session, you can set it to automatically save their session, and then they'll have this to be able to go back to. So now I go home, or I go to my next class, log in on another device, or go home and log into my own device, and I go to my Session Buddy, and I have all the sessions opened, or all the sessions that I have saved rather on the left-hand side, and I can open any of them and then get right back to what it was that I was working on just by clicking on it. So very handy extension to have. It is free. And similar is the One tab. So this is the icon here for One tab up in the top right. My mouse hovered over it says One tab. It's similar. When I click on One tab, it does just that. So first of all, it puts all my open tabs into one, saving speed. If you have too many windows open, it slows your computer down. And now it has everything I'm working on in the list format. So maybe I, I want to have visually here everything I'm working on, but open up one thing at a time, but I'm focused on that one particular thing. For educators, a lot of times as many websites that you want to share or resources with your students, maybe you're using Google Classroom and sharing it, and sharing it through there. That's excellent. If you haven't dove into Google Classroom yet, you want all of your learners to have these websites or resources, just open them all up, click on one tab, and now you can share this as a web page. So that third option here, I can share this as a web page, which means one link to all the students in a Google Doc gets them to all of these links. So you don't have to wait for them to type in the URL and waste time waiting for all of them to get there or not getting there. You can just send them this list of resources with one link. And of course, if you're tech savvy or they are, you have this nice QR code, and they can have a free QR code app on any of their mobile devices to get to all of these links as well or they can just simply click on any of these links that you sent them to get to them. Um, so a nice option certainly to use, whether it's Session Buddy or OneTab or both. And I'm just restoring all now, you can see, to open my tabs back up here. So the next one on the list is called Read and Write for Google. So all the other extensions that I've shown you have been free. Again, the majority are. Read and Write for Google is a very comprehensive toolbar. Uh, won't be able to show you all the ins and outs of this because this could be an all-day training in itself, but want to show you some of the major features that could benefit your diverse learners. It does work on the Internet, so I'm in Google Chrome. It also works in Google Docs, and it works through PDF worksheets. So they have an accompanying app called Snap Further. It is on your handout with a video of how to use it, which will make those PDF worksheets accessible so that they can type into them, speak into them, use word prediction, have it read out loud. It makes those worksheets accessible to them as well as their websites and documents that they're working on. So just to highlight a few of the features on the toolbar, uh, first of all, if you go into settings, you can change the voice and the speed, and you can change the features that are on the toolbar. So you can see there's several, but maybe your student only needs one or two or three, or all of these would be distracting. You're only going to introduce one or two at a time. You can simply turn them off or have all of them available if they're a learner that's going to use all of them. The text-to-speech is excellent. So this particular extension is free for 30 days for students. And then there's a yearly fee. It's a subscription, but it allows you to have access to read and write on all devices, Chrome and iOS. And for educators or any staff members who work for a school, 
it's absolutely free for you to have access to all these features on the toolbar if you want to be using them with your students. Um, there's a registration form that's on your handout, on that handout. I will put the link up at the end again, and it will be emailed to you again in case you're joining us later. So there is a link for the registration form where you can register and have this toolbar for free. And after the 30 days for students, if you're going to trial it to see if it's something that would benefit them from uh, before purchasing it, the text-to-speech after the 30-day trial will always stay free, as well as the reading support tool and the translation tool. So sometimes they may just need really excellent text-to-speech with highlighting to improve their comprehension, their fluency, their decoding, um, a nice pleasant voice, and that's always going to stay free. There are other apps and extensions listed on your handout for free text-to-speech if you don't have Read and Write. But if you compare the voice and the highlighting, the read and write is still the better quality, and this feature will stay free even after the trial. So I'm going to click on the little hover speech bubble and then move my mouse to where it's going to begin speaking the text. So I just clicked on the speech bubble to stop the speech. You can see that it highlights as it's reading. It is a pleasant voice. You can change the speed and the highlight as well as the voice. There's also a dictionary and a picture dictionary. So if a learner gets to a word they're not familiar with, they just highlight it with their mouse, click on the dictionary tool. They can have this definition read out loud to them just by clicking on the little play button that pops up next to it. There's the picture dictionary for your visual learners or younger learners who may um, benefit from that visual support. So if you highlight a word and then click on the picture dictionary, it will populate if there is a picture icon available in their library. The screenshot reader is an excellent tool. A lot of times your learners are getting to a locked PDF of text that can't be read with typical screen readers, whether it's a scanned worksheet or a handout, an accompanying ebook website that you have for a lot of your books that you're using in classes, science, social studies, science, a lot has that ebook, even English, and they get to that website and they can't have it read out loud. So the screenshot reader will read those inaccessible texts out loud. Um, so it's nice to have access to that particular tool. MP3 maker or speech maker, so they can highlight a lot of text and have it converted to uh, MP3 files. They can load it onto their phone or their iPod and be listening to it on the go. They don't have to have a laptop or a Chromebook on their lap. Listen to it in between sports practice or in the car, on the bus, things like that. Screen masking tool here. So again, you click on screen masking, it's going to give you a nice mouse spotlight to keep track of where you're reading. There is word prediction, which was the first icon on the toolbar, and speech input. I'm going to demonstrate both of those to you in a Google Doc, just so that you're aware. But nice to know that they are available in, a, in the internet or on a website. And that's because so many things are online now. College applications are online. Job applications are online. Those students who need support when they're filling those out with word prediction or speech input, really great to know that they can use these tools in that setting. They can speak into their applications. They can speak into those documents that they need to, even if it's social media, to talk with their friends or use that word prediction. I'll be demonstrating those tools in the Google Doc, but good for you to know that they work here in the Internet as well. Highlighters, when we're talking about universal design for learning, a lot of these features Excellent for all of your learners in the classroom, but some of these are going to be critically supportive to your diverse learners. So typically students are researching on the website. They're going through and picking out important information that they're going to put into a paper or a project. Typically they're reading it, writing it down, reading it, writing it down. For some of your learners, they may be listening to it and then writing it down. And that can be a very difficult process for a lot of our students that struggle with writing or picking out important information. So instead they can highlight with their mouse and then choose a color. Great if they're going to highlight everything in one color, but nice that you have different colors to use so you can separate by category or topic. This is excellent for organization of thought. So I'm going to highlight all my important dates in one color, all of my important places in another, or maybe all of my important characters, or maybe I'm going to compare one state to another and one state's going to be in blue and the other one's going to be in green, for example, whatever the method is. I have some reading teachers that specifically separate by verb, noun, adjective, etc. Um, other reading teachers that will separate digraphs versus blends. You can think of various ways how you would use these highlights. Um, so again, 
highlight the important information that you want to take from this website, and you could either sweep them away, meaning get rid of your highlights, but most people want to collect them. So this is the collect icons in the toolbar, the little arrow with circle of arrows here. We can collect by colors, so they're going to put our yellows together, our greens together, our blues together. Again, really great for organizing our thoughts before we write our paper. Or we can change this to position. It's going to collect all of our highlights exactly in the order that we took them. I have it set by color. I click OK. Again, this is Google, read and write for Google. So it is going to take all of my highlights and put it into a nice Google Doc for me. You can see it's put my yellows together and my other colors together. And then at the end, it does have a link to get back to that website. Maybe we forgot or we want to get back to that place where we got all these nice resources and take more. So you click on that link to get back to that, and it has my name, of course, at the end. If I have learners using this, I always point out in the top left here, this is the title of their Google Doc. It says Highlights Untitled. This saves automatically to their Google Drive, which is excellent. They don't even have to worry about saving it, but they don't want to have a lot of highlights untitled in their Google Drive. So make sure that they specifically take the time to name all of their documents, including the highlights. So I would put something that my highlights are related to, for example. I'm going to just move this to the trash finish out on our website here. So again, we can get rid of our highlights. Just re-highlight them and hit that little broom to sweep them away. We have some other great features on the toolbar, the vocabulary tool, uh, the Simplify page. I just clicked on Simplify page icon, and you can see many times when we're researching on the Internet, an ad starts playing or a video starts playing. It's very annoying to us. It's very annoying to our students certainly distracts them. All they want to do is read that article and instead they're trying to figure out how to turn off that video or that ad. So the Simplify tool, it takes that reading article, puts it in a nice clean reading space here, gets rid of the ads, gets rid of the videos. They can still use this toolbar to listen aloud, get definitions, highlight, and they can simplify this content even further. So they hit the Simplify button and you can see that it's shortening the article. It's taking the most important facts and shortening it. It is not summarizing it. However, there are definitely free apps for summarizing, so check that out. Just search for summarizing. There are a couple on the handout as well. But this is simplifying. It's taking the most important facts from that long article, and it's simplifying into a shorter one for some of our learners who may need that. It opened up in a separate tab here, so you can see I can get back to the original website very quick and easy. It didn't take it over. Um, so if I want to get to another link on that particular website, this is a nice reading practice tool. Um, so for our learners who are practicing reading, they can choose a passage of text. Any good reading program certainly has the option for choosing a passage of text at their grade level or just above that they're going to practice reading. So highlight a passage of text that's something relevant or something interesting to them. Choose the reading practice reading aloud tool. It's going to take that passage of text and bring it into a new window. So now they can practice reading it on their own first out loud. Then they can use the toolbar to listen to it. And then they can use the microphone to record themselves reading it. And that's a little kite on the right-hand side here allows them to send their recording to a teacher or a parent. You can listen to it, listen to their fluency, listen to where they made mistakes. If you have them read for over a minute, you can certainly time it and um, specifically note where they made omissions or subtractions or all those things that you would typically do during a reading record type of assessment. Um, so a great tool to have on the toolbar there. Um, so just based on time, because we want to make sure we get over to iOS, I'm going to open up a new Google Doc. Um, so I'm going to get rid of the toolbar here, going to my apps, and I'm going to open up a new blank Google Doc. So the writing support tools that are part of Read and Write, again, if we had a PDF worksheet open, you could be typing into it, speaking into it. Uh, for time purposes, I'm going to demonstrate in a typical Google Doc. Pull down my toolbar. The word prediction tool, while I'm typing, is going to offer me this nice box similar to texting. It's predicting two ways, phonetically and contextually. Phonetically, what I may be trying to type that's difficult to spell. Contextually, if I start typing about baseball, words about baseball are going to start to populate. So the more I write, the better it gets. If I look at that box and I'm not sure which word I want based on my spelling difficulty, I can use my mouse to hover over them and listen to them out loud first. And then click on it to put into my document. So it certainly can help speed up typing, help me 
um, use vocabulary that may be more difficult for me to spell, but certainly if I have support with spelling that difficult word, I'm going to put those words into my document or my paper and use a higher level vocabulary. If I hear it, I know what it is, but it would be difficult for me to spell. Word prediction is excellent for that type of support. And then also the speech input. So there's speech input here on this toolbar. There's also speech input built into our Google Docs if you haven't heard of voice typing yet. Um, by clicking on this headset microphone, you're going to see um, that I'll be able to start using my voice to type. And again, just remember that this also works on the Internet when you have read and write. So college applications, job applications, social media, email, other places where they may need to use their voice to type, not just in Google Docs, they would have access to if they have the read and write speech input. So I'm going to click on the headset and you'll see a microphone appear and I'm going to start to speak my words. Now I can begin using my voice to speak or to type and say things like photosynthesis or phlebotomy without worrying about spelling period. I'm going to the store today, period. Do you need anything to New line. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Really great. You don't have to create a voice profile or do anything in particular. You can just start talking. Um, you can listen to this. So I can hit the play button and listen for mistakes. I get asked to say that a lot by students. Um, so it does really work well and efficiently. Just remember if you're introducing a student or adult learner to speak to type or voice recognition or speech input, voice typing, all the different things that it's called, it does take time. It takes training. Don't start with something academic. Just start to talk to that person about things that they're interested in. Let them see them get their words out on, on the page. And remember to tell them they have to speak as they typically do. Um, so it's definitely more efficient and accurate if they talk like they typically talk. It does certainly work for many of my individuals who do have a speech impairment, so don't rule that out. I have students with apraxia and um, cerebral palsy who have a difficult time with speaking. They get themselves ready. They practice what they want to say first. It helps them to speak more clearly because they're trying to speak louder and clearer in order for this to work efficiently, and it has been working very well for those individuals. Um, but again, if they speak slow and watch the screen because they're worried about it making mistakes, it is going to make mistakes. So sometimes it's better even for to have them not look at the screen while they're talking and then look back after it's typed because it will make corrections based on context. So if they get the entire sentence out and it's made mistakes previously, they'll watch those words flip and it actually makes the corrections based on context. Um, so some key things to remember if you're going to introduce speech to type. If you're just using a Google Doc and you don't have Read and Write, remember that there is free voice typing under Tools. There's a spell check there, there's word count, and there's voice typing. So you can still access voice typing in a Google Doc if you don't have Read and Write. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to switch over to iOS. Again, that handout has several, several apps and extensions, mind mapping and brainstorming, scheduling and reminders, digital agendas, math support, reading support great ones, check them out. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start reflecting my iPad so that I can show you some of the iOS accessibility features and apps that you may want to use if your student is using an iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad Pro, etc. Um, you may want to check out some of these particular apps on the iPad. Um, so first what we'll start with, I'm reflecting my iPad now. You can see it on the screen. That is my iPad on the screen on my desktop. I'm just using Air Server. And on the bottom, that little icon that looks like a gear are your settings. Always remember that there are built-in accessibility features on these iOS devices before you even add any apps that make them very accessible to individuals with disabilities as well as our diverse learners. On the left-hand side, you're on general. On the right-hand side, we're going to tap on accessibility. Several, several accessibility features that we could spend an entire day training on again. We have limited time, so I want to touch upon a few of the major ones. Um, VoiceOver certainly will speak everything out loud on the screen. The built-in pinch zoom most of us are familiar with on our phones or our iPads or our tablets, the reverse pinch 
typically makes things bigger. But here in menus and in certain apps, you can't do that. You can't reverse pinch on this menu, for example, to make it larger, but this may be too small. So that second one under voiceover is called Zoom. And with Zoom on, it's a gesture of three finger double taps. So any three fingers, one, two on your screen, um, and it will magnify, and you can move it with three fingers. So it can make it even larger. Three finger double tap, one, two, makes it small again. And if we specifically go into our Zoom settings, in our Zoom region, we can change this to be Window Zoom. So now if I do three finger double tap, I get this nice little magnifying glass that I can move by putting my finger on that little tab at the bottom. And it's going to magnify what's in this particular window that I'm moving, which will also work on the home screen or any app that I'm in. Sometimes on this home screen, these icons are too, still too small for someone to see, so they can magnify it. If I tap on this little tab, at the bottom, I can increase or decrease the size of the magnification in my window. I can resize the lens so I can make it a square. I can make it a smaller square or a larger square. I can also add a filter like high contrast or those inverted colors that we talked about. So if I go back into my settings, you can see the inverse colors, does that white on black, that high contrast that so many individuals with low vision need. And you can also turn on inverse colors for the entire screen, or you can just have it here in this little magnifying glass that you're using as you go along with Zoom. Um, so you can see that there's many options for Zoom. And again, that three finger double tap, one, two, makes it disappear or reappear as you need it. So nice to have that additional Zoom. Magnifier is excellent. Now with iOS 10 built into the camera to magnify, change colors, invert colors as I mentioned, the black on white or the white on black rather. Larger text, you can increase the text size in the menus, in your notes, text messages. Switch control, certainly for your learners who need access to uh, the iPad or iOS devices using the switch. Really love to show assistive touch. So with assistive touch on, this little black square or gray square rather with the, a circle stays on top of anything that you're doing. Again, someone with limited physical access can tap on this and get to a menu very quickly. They can get back to the home button. But look, they can also do gestures like triple click. So if they physically can't hit that home button three times, they can use assistive touch, tap triple click, and it does that gesture for them. And triple click brings up my accessibility shortcut so I can turn on voiceover or invert colors. And you can change what is on this assistive touch menu. So if I go into customize top level and add something, these are all of the things that I can add to assistive touch, meaning all I have to do is touch it once, and it does this. It can pinch for me, it can double tap for me, it can turn a page. This is really significant for our learners or individuals who have a physical disability and need this additional support. You can also create custom gestures here. So really a lot that you can go into it as far as the accessibility features here. Um, there are a lot of videos and websites. I think a couple of them are listed on your handout. I certainly can add to it, <clears throat> but want to get into the app for you this evening. Certainly reach out to me with my contact information if you need more information on the built accessibility features. And I'm going to dive into a few of the apps that you might find helpful for your learners. The first one is called Voice Dream Reader. Again, all these are listed on your handout. Voice Dream Reader will access their Google Drive, any documents in the Google Drive. It will also access books from Bookshare, and Bookshare is free. Um, this, these are settings that uh, previous learners showed, so it's not always going to look green and blue. You can change those colors. It typically will pull in as black and gray or black on white. Plus button to the top left allows you to pull in books or documents from Dropbox, Google Drive, which a lot of schools are using. Bookshare, again, if you haven't used Bookshare in a while, bookshare.org, a free resource for the textbooks, math, science, reading, social studies, chapter books, novels, things that students are using for pleasure reading, or book reports, or silent sustained reading. All those books can be pulled in here to make accessible for your learners. When we tap on a book that is on our bookshelf, I'm just going to go into the Silk Road, change so many options here. Again, the text is a little bit bigger and changed from what it would typically pull in as from the last person that I worked on this with. So you can change the font size. You can change the font style. It's currently on the open dyslexic font. There's also chalkboard, Avenir Next, Arial, a lot of the fonts that you're familiar with. Any book, any worksheet or handout that they need in an accessible font. The open dyslexic and the dyslexic font, 
specifically created by individuals with dyslexia, has the heavier weighted tops and bottoms of letters, slightly slanted, can certainly improve comprehension and speed as well as fluency. So good to be able to expose your learners to, to see if it's something that they choose and prefer. Text size up to 90 point. If you are currently taking your worksheets or handouts and blowing them up, you can stop, pull them into Voice Stream Reader through Google Drive, and um, certainly be able to customize that font size for the learner. So we can put this back down. You can also add spaces and characters between lines, which is really great. And color settings. So you can see that my text is black right now, a green background. Excellent for our learners who need a color overlay if they're using something for that. You can do it digitally. Also great, again, for our high contrast learners who need white on black or yellow on black. You can set that very quickly and easily. You can also already choose from their light or dark settings. So if you need access to the particular color settings for your reader, you can set them here. And we're going to go back into our custom. Lines visible, you can have five lines, three lines, or one. Really great for screen masking. And there's Pac-Man mode and regular reading mode. So I'm going to turn off Pac-Man mode to show you what it would read like typically without Pac-Man mode. Diana, can you turn your volume up on your iPad? Oh, sure. It wasn't coming through there. I will try that. Thank you. Hopefully you were able to hear that better. If not, I apologize for the sound quality. Um, <clears throat> in the audio setting, you can choose either the male or female voice to come with it for free. You can make the speech faster or slower, and you can add voices, several voices, um, adult voices, child voices, voices with accents, really great voices for English language learners, um, Peter Happy and Peter Sad, so really great for the intonation uh, for things like Edgar Allan Poe, Peter Sad, or Peter Happy if you're going to be reading something that's really funny. So it's a lot of different options for languages as well as voices in this particular app. And we're going to <clears throat> get out of our voices here. The bottom left is the icon, so you can search by bookmark or chapter or highlights. I'll show you how to create highlights. Bottom left, 27 of 120, that's what page I'm on. Tap on there, and you can see that you can get to a particular page in this book just by typing it in. It looks like I already took some highlights and sticky notes here. The bottom right is a magnifying glass. You can search, so maybe I don't remember what page or what chapter but I remember something that happened. So I'm going to type in a keyword, and now I get all the places where this keyword is. I can play it out loud first. I have my assistive touch here still pulled up. I'm just going to move that over. Um, so I can play that particular part and then get back to that particular part in the book as well. Highlights for sticky notes, if I press and hold on the screen, let's go to a word, press and hold, and I get this little mini toolbar. I can certainly get a definition if I need to, or I can move these little bookmarks and then hit highlight. And that's the color that I chose in my color setting. So my highlight can be pink, yellow, purple, whatever I want to highlight in. That same option, press and hold on the screen, allows me to add a sticky note. Um, so really great in-text citations. Maybe this is something I need to remember for a comprehension question or a quiz. And it does speak it out loud, so I can save that sticky note. As I'm going back through, I can tap on my sticky notes and have these pop up. So these are really great. A lot of times a teacher reading through with the student is going to have them put a sticky note sometimes for those metacognitive places where they want the student to stop. Later when they're doing homework, they see that sticky note. It says things like, what just happened? What do you think is going to happen next? Does this ever happen to you, et cetera? Those metacognitive prompts for them to stop, reflect upon their reading. You can also choose specific reading modes like finger reading speed. So if they can't slow it down enough, you can choose finger reading speed where it's going to read out loud as they follow along with their finger. A lot of really great accessibility settings in Voice Dream Reader. And you can pull in books from Bookshare, other resources on the Internet, or things from Google Drive. For your learners who need access to worksheets and handouts in digital format, Claro PDF Pro in the middle there, and Go Worksheet to the right of it, really great options. I'm going to pull up Claro PDF Pro. So with Claro PDF Pro, 
for your students who get handed the paper worksheet and that is not accessible to them, they cannot type into that worksheet, they cannot handwrite into it because it's difficult for them, they would benefit from having it in digital format. Your students who have the legal right under IDEA to accessible learning materials need to have their worksheets and handouts in digital format. You can do so with Clairol PDF. So you can see this is an example of a main idea worksheet that I pulled in. The reverse pinch on an iPad is great. I can make this large print immediately. I can choose the built-in features on the iPad to do inverse colors. There are learners who need the high contrast white on black immediately with the built-in accessibility features of the iPad. It's not going to show up for you while I'm using Air Server, but you can have white on black for their worksheets and handouts as well. And on the, um, just by tapping on the text. Main idea. Read each passage and ask yourself, what is the author doing in this paragraph? Right. You can change the voice, the speed, the highlight color, all in the settings. And then the second icon is to edit the worksheet. But first on the top left, I'm going to tap on this folder. And this will show you that you could scan these worksheets and handouts in, save them to Google Drive, and your student can pull them in from Google Drive. Or the other option, the very last option in this drop down is photo to PDF. Use the camera in the iPad, take a picture of the worksheet, and it's going to pull it in as PDF. The second option to the top right is that convert PDF. So it's going to do that OCR, optical character recognition, so that they can hear it out loud and also type into it. Great for adults as well. I use this constantly. People send me things I need to fill out, sign, send back to them. I don't have to print it out, scan it. I open it in Clearo PDF, I fill it in, I sign it, boom, send it back to them. So again, universal design. All of our learners can benefit from this. But for our struggling learners who absolutely need this, for things like word prediction or speech input, which I'm going to show you, it can be really critical for them accessing their worksheets and handouts or listening to them so that a human person doesn't have to read their instructions for them. So tapping on that pencil icon that's on paper, I can now access my toolbar. I could handwrite on this. I would use a stylus or my hand. I can choose the color, the thickness. I can handwrite on here. It's going to be a little bit messy at this angle. I could certainly do math if I wanted to do that. And um, everything that I type or write on here stays on here. I have an eraser, so if I make a mistake, I can simply erase. And then I can tap on the T and tap where I want to begin typing. And now I have a lot of accessibility options to me. I can use this built-in keyboard that comes with the iPad or iOS device. Or I can pull in, um, or rather use the microphone first. So the microphone to the left of the space bar allows me to speak my words into this worksheet or handout. Speak my answer. Or I can use what's called a third-party keyboard. So I can tap where I want to begin typing, and I can download alternative keyboards from the App Store and then allow them in my keyboards. And when I want to use that additional keyboard or that alternative keyboard, I tap on the globe. And I've already downloaded several alternative keyboards. I tap on the globe and I can go to the keyboard that I want to use. This one is called Read and Write for iPad. Um, so again, if you get the Read and Write subscription, you get Read and Write for iPad as well. You can color code your vowels. You can change the font on the specific keyboard. And as I am typing, it's predicting what I may be trying to type. But what's different about this particular app is there are many word prediction uh, keyboards, rather, not apps, but it is an app. So what's different about this one is I can listen to these words in my, in my toolbar first. So those may be difficult for someone to read, and they don't want it automatically to go into the document until they hear it first. So they tap on it to hear it. And then when they choose the word that they want to put into their document, they simply swipe or double tap to put it into their document. They can also hear this read out loud. So once they have an entire sentence, they can spell check, a lot of different options. There are a lot of other keyboards, third-party keyboards to consider using. Um, another one is KeyDogo Plus, which a lot of individuals like. There's also Keyble and SuperKeys. Um, so check out that handout for other options for third-party keyboards. And again, everything that they type into any time this typical keyboard pops up, they can use an additional keyboard. They have that option, and you can move the text. And then when you're done with the worksheet or handout, you can certainly print it, send it through Google Drive, 
um, whatever way, share it through Google Drive, rather email it, any of those options, it's not stuck, so they can share that worksheet or handout. Go Worksheet is another option. <clears throat> and I have some screenshots of a few of the other apps that I wanted to show you. We're already close to the end of an hour. It goes by so quickly. Um, but some of the other apps such as ChoiceWorks for schedules and for um, going through first I need to through my day and then putting it in the all done with visual timers. ChoiceWorks is an excellent one to consider. You can add videos or pictures. Um, they have visual timers, which is really great. This one in particular is called Better Vision for our low vision users on the iPad. Starts off with four large icons that are already high contrast. And by going into the settings and then the color palette, just like a CCTV and just like we did with those other extensions, you can choose white on black, yellow on black for reading a book on the go or work to your handout or even zooming in on the whiteboard instruction for a teacher. Um, so if I was zooming in on a book, for example, I can use the slider to zoom in. I could pause it and move it. I could choose to change the color in the color palette, which is going to give me high contrast like that. Um, so another great app to add. Um, and then this is the, these are the screenshots for Google Worksheet, the other option for making accessible worksheets. Again, you can take a picture of it or pull it in. And you can do various things with Go Worksheet, like add text-to-speech, fill in the blank, drag and drop answers, which is really, really great. Um, so for your learners who would benefit from making this worksheet accessible, so they can literally tap and drag the answer and have it read out loud to them. Um, so check out Go Worksheet as well. They can handwrite. They can even record their answers um, verbally into Go Worksheet. So several options. Again, we just can't get to them all because there are so many to share with you. I will share. One more before we close out called Notability. Notability is really great for taking notes on the iOS devices. And there are similar extensions listed on your handout, like Might Note if you want to do this in Google Chrome. Um, so Notability is specifically for iOS, the iPad. It does separate our topics or our subjects into different folders that we can color code if we choose to. If I tap on Biology, you can see I'm in my Biology folder. History, Science, if I'm in my Science class, I want to start taking a note to the top right. I would tap on the pencil icon. I can choose my paper. So many options to use Notability. I can add color. I can have lines, or I can have graph paper. I can use the microphone to start recording, which is really important. So it's recording the lecture, which means I don't have to write everything that was said. I could handwrite using a stylus or using my hands. Um, again, certainly if this is math, we could be doing math. I could draw results. I could graph if we were in graph paper. Use the eraser if I make a mistake. Certainly highlight anything important. And I can type my notes as well. I can also pull in pictures or sticky notes from the web. I can take a photo of what's on the board and pull it in. I can take a photo of a worksheet and pull it in. I can pull in videos or web clips. There's really so much that you can do with Notability. And then when you're done with the recording, we can have this played back and it syncs to the notes. So when I play back the recording, I tap on my notes and I hear what was said at that time. So even if I take five pages of notes, for example, I can go to page 10, tap on what was said, and my notes play back for me as well as that recording. So I don't have to take down everything that was said. I can take down the important things or timestamp it, add to my notes. And if it's like a math problem, for example, I see it step by step written out again so I can do my homework. Or if I have to add to my notes or study something for a test or a quiz coming up. You can save the notes to Google Drive. You can save the recording to iTunes. This is definitely the app I use professionally when I go to professional development workshops myself to record, take notes, and go back to. And for students, really helps them to be independent note takers. And again, similar tools in Google Chrome, such as Mic Note and others. And there's the Smart Pen for those who want to use an actual pen with a smart notebook. Various options versus technology to support the note taking process. And unfortunately, now I have to stop sharing my screen. But if you do have any questions at this time, please feel free as I um, start to come back to the main screen of the webinar to type your questions into the chat. And I will address them as I can. If you have any, feel free to type them into the chat right now. Any specific questions about apps or extensions or how to access them in Google Chrome or iOS, please feel free to put them into the chat now. And I'm happy to answer them. 
and give you a couple of minutes. If you have any questions, my contact information is there as well. Please connect with us through our website, through Facebook, through Twitter, LinkedIn. We definitely uh, present often across the country. You'll know when we're training, we post exciting assistive technology updates as well as when there's free webinars. Yes, definitely we'll give you the link to the handout. Here it is in the presentation as well. If you want to copy that down, write it down, take a picture. It was emailed to you, and it will be emailed to you again. Um, what about Google getting rid of apps next year? Well, that's a question that comes up often. Feel free to email me if you'd like to. I will send you the research. The apps and extensions that you already had are not going to go away. They're going to be continued to be supported um, just so that you don't have that fear. Um, and I have all the specifics, but you're safe right now if you're using any Google Apps or extensions. There are new ones that won't be continued. There are new ones that won't be uh, utilized, but all the ones that you're using now, you will still have access to. And ironically, a lot of the um, Chromebooks are accessing Google Play, which means now you can get Android apps on those Chromebooks. Uh, which is awesome because if you like Voice Dream Reader, for example, on the iPad, it's also available on Android, which means on some of those Chromebooks, we're going to be able to access those apps. Read and Write for Google is free to students for 30 days, and only certain parts would still work. Yes. So Read and Write for Google is free for 30 days, and then the text-to-speech with highlighting always stays free, as well as the translation, and that reading fluency practice tool always stay free, so even if they need it just for those purposes. All the other features are premium features, and it's a yearly subscription. Um, some schools are just deciding to get it for all students to use. It's available at many college campuses as well. Really great for all learners as far as UDL, and really great for those students transitioning. They can ask for um, campuses if they have Read and Write on campus. Sometimes they have the Google version. Sometimes they have the software version. Um, so yes, absolutely, and free to all of you educators or staff members through that link on the handout. If you want to fill out the registration form, you can have Read and Write Google for free. And thank you for joining us this evening. Feel free to follow up with me if you have any questions or comments about anything that I presented this evening as well. Thanks for your attendance, and feel free to watch the recording.